Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Glad you're here. Let me share a couple of announcements. First is this. If you're in the leadership training, that's going to take place this afternoon, 430 at my house. Also, spring baptism right now is scheduled for May 21st. If you're interested in being baptized next month, you need to get your testimony to me uh, at least by next Sunday. Uh, also, if you would like to become a member of Grace Bible Church, uh, here's what you need to do. You need to write out your testimony. You need to go to our website, gracebible.online, and you need to click on the Doctrine tab, and you can see what this church believes. And you need to ask yourself, do I agree with this doctrine? Uh, you can also click on the church covenant there, and you can read the church covenant, and you can ask yourself, am I willing to live with these people by this church covenant? So that's what you need to do if you're interested in membership. Josh, will you please come and read a call to worship? Psalms 142 says, With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry out, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that, um, that, you, that you give us good examples in the scriptures of depression, Lord. Here's, here's David depressed. He's hiding in a cave, Lord, and he's crying out to you, uh, and, and he's calling you his refuge. Lord, we thank you that you are our refuge. Um, we thank you that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to this earth, that the Lord Jesus had ministry, and that he uh, went to a cross, and he died, and he was buried, and we learned today he rose again, Lord, that he sealed that victory by rising from the dead. He, he stands at your right hand today representing us, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit sent to us as a helper uh, that makes uh, our prayers known to you, Lord, that, that cries out the things that we don't know to say uh, with great deep moanings. Lord, we pray that you would hear our prayers this morning, hear our song this morning, that you'd hear the word preached this morning, Lord, and that we would hear it too and we'd take it to heart. We praise you and we thank you. It's your name we pray. Stand and sing.
mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Good morning. I'll be reading out of uh, Luke 18, 1 through 8. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart, he said. In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in the city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him every day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, this time of worship that we can come to you. Lord, and we fail so many times to uh, properly give you praise and worship and reverence and esteem throughout our week, Lord, when we're not in this setting, Lord. And I pray that uh, this setting today, as we hear the music, we sing the songs, Lord, that properly dictate your truth, I pray that uh, that will spread out through our lives as well when we go home when we uh, disciple our children, when we love our families, Lord, I pray that you are foremost in, in our minds and in our hearts with that. Be with Brent today as he preaches your word. I pray that you give him the supernatural strength it takes for any man to stand behind a pulpit and to preach your word, Lord. For every man should do it with fear and trembling. And I, I know there's been many hours of study, many hours of reflection, Lord, and I pray that uh, whatever is said here today will only bring you glory. For you're the only one who deserves that glory, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.
be found in your way, in your copy of God's Word, to the 88th Psalm, the 88th Psalm. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, we thank you that we can be here with other believers meeting in public this morning uh, without fear. Just praise you for the privilege of public worship. We know that that is a privilege that we take for granted and that literally millions of Christians all over the world do not have and would do anything to enjoy and experience. Thank you that you've given us this great privilege to worship you through a song and through the hearing of your inspired word. We pray, Father, that as we come to Psalm 88, that you would give us insight, that you would minister to our hearts, that the Holy Spirit would shed light on this text, uh, shed light on how we are to respond, and shed light on the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. Pray, Father, for each person that you've brought here this morning. Help us to pay attention. Uh, help us to profit from what's being said. And we ask, Lord, that uh, through this psalm you would increase our faith. I pray for my own self. I ask that you would give me the strength to speak as one speaking the very words of God. I pray that you'd set a guard over my mouth, that I wouldn't say anything that would bring you reproach or reflect badly on the Lord Jesus. Uh, I ask, Father, that you'd forgive me of all my sins, because as we sang earlier, they are many, and we praise you that the mercy of Christ is more. Uh, forgive me, Father, for... Uh, uh, hypocrisy for uh, sin of life and lip and walk, and most of all, uh, for the simple fact that above all things I have not loved the Lord Jesus. I have not loved him with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength, and I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I thank you that Jesus came down from heaven, and he's the only person who ever did that in a way 
that pleases you, Father, and that he is my righteousness this morning. He is our righteousness. So we want to hear your word under the blood, and I want to preach under the blood. Thank you for Christ. Help us now. Amen. Hopefully you have made your way to Psalm 88. I'm going to read the whole thing, all 18 verses, <coughs> including the superscription, which says this, a psalm. Psalm of the sons of Korah to the choir master according to Mahaloth Leonoth, a maskil of Heman the Ezrahite. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. Verse 6, you have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. I'm sure that some of you have visited the caverns in eastern Tennessee. Uh, if you've not visited those, maybe you've been to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Uh, I have been to, to both of those places, and one of the most profound experiences of visiting these underground caves is when you get about a quarter mile under the ground and the tour guide cuts off the lights. And after about two or three minutes of your eyes adjusting, uh, you realize this is probably the first time you've ever been in a place in your whole life with absolutely zero light whatsoever. And after about four or five minutes of that, the darkness just seems to soak into you. It seems to get down into your bones and your eyes are just straining as hard as they can to find any shred of light anywhere. There is none to be found. And that is a somewhat... Uh, rattling experience and then they turn the lights back on and, and the next thing you think is I, I hope the power doesn't go off while we're down here. <laughs> well there are many passages of scripture that describe the Christian life in ways that are hopeful, optimistic and comforting. For example Proverbs 4 and verse 18 is one such verse. Proverbs 4 18 says this, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter until full day. But anyone who's been a Christian for a while knows that this light that shines brighter and brighter until full day can at times be totally eclipsed in the Christian life. There are times when the sun is not shining in our souls. Uh, there are times as Christians when there is no moon in the night sky, there are not even any little stars twinkling. The European uh, Christians of the Middle Ages called this the dark night of the soul. Times when we're plunged into deep spiritual darkness that is thick and heavy and seemingly impenetrable. The dark night of the soul is a season of spiritual anguish that is intense in which a struggling and despairing believer feels like he is abandoned by God. Any Christian who lives long enough will eventually experience this dark night of the soul, this spiritual depression, this feeling of being forsaken by God. Uh, that's why the 19th century British preacher Joseph Parker said this. He said, preach to the suffering and you will never lack for a congreg congregation because there's a broken heart in every pew. 
That is true. Preach to the suffering. You will never lack for a congregation. There's a broken heart in every pew. And so as we come to Psalm 88, we want to analyze it with the following question, which is this. How do we navigate seasons of darkness and despair? How do we navigate seasons of darkness and despair? I believe that the psalmist gives us three answers. The first is this. Number one, realize that you're not the only Christian who feels this way. Realize you're not the only Christian who feels this way. So Psalm 88 is the bleakest psalm in the entire Bible. It begins with despair. Look at verse 3. Psalmist says, my soul is full of trouble. It carries on in despair. Look at verse 9. He says, my eye grows dim through sorrow. And then it ends in total despair. Look at the last half of verse 18. It says, my companions have become darkness. So one-third of the psalms are lament psalms. Psalm 88 is a lament psalm. There's 150 psalms, about a third of them. 50, 52 are lament psalms. And all the other lament psalms differ from Psalm 88 in this way. All the other ones end with a note of hope. Psalm 88 does not end with any ray of hope. There's almost zero hope in this psalm whatsoever. So what is a seemingly hopeless psalm like this doing in the pages of scripture. Well, Psalm 88 is a precious gift to Christians who feel trapped in deep despair because it reminds us that when we feel utterly hopeless and abandoned, we're not the only Christian who has ever felt this way. We're not the only believers who feel this way even now. Uh, One of the most painful things about this feeling of being abandoned by God, this dark night of the soul, is to think I'm the only one who has ever experienced this. And so we begin to to question if we're really true believers at all. How can I feel this hopeless and be someone who has hope in Christ or saving faith in Christ? And so it's a comfort to know that other true believers have felt this deep and abiding darkness. Now, notice the superscription over this bleak psalm. Uh, I I would say if you're reading the ESV in print, it would be verse 0. Uh, I I noticed as I read this psalm in different translations that the verses were numbered differently. Some of your translations number them starting verse 1 with the superscription. Uh, Mine starts verse 1 with the next verse, O Lord God of my salvation. So I'm going to refer to several verses in the psalm today. And if I'm off by one number, then that's the reason, okay? Your, Your translation has started the numbering in the superscription rather than in the first verse. And so if you look at that superscription, verse 0, it says, A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah to the choir master according to Mahaloth Leonoth, a masculine of Heman the Ezrahite. Who in the world is this Heman fellow? Uh, well, he was one of the pioneers of the singing guilds set up by King David called the Korahites who wrote 13 of the 150 psalms. So Heman was a worship leader commissioned by David to lead Israel in the public praise of God. And Heman was evidently still serving in this capacity when David's son Solomon took the throne. Listen to 1 Kings 4.31, which says this. It says, Solomon was wiser than all other men. He was wiser than Ethan the Ezraite and who? Heman. Heman. So Heman was an inspired author of Holy Scripture, Uh, He was a man who was so wise that the wisest man who has ever lived, Solomon, Solomon's wisdom was compared with that of Heman. So he, he was a public worship leader and one of the wisest men who ever lived. And knowing that he was an author of inspired scripture and an eminent believer in Israel, Uh, reminds us that that even the most mature believers can sometimes get into a place of the deepest darkness, okay? What my point is is Heman was not a recent convert. He was a very mature believer in the Lord. There have been many such mature believers who experienced this dark night of the soul. Uh, All throughout Scripture we can see this. Think of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, who was called the weeping prophet. Jeremiah 4.19 Prophet Jeremiah says this. He says, my anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. You ever hurt so bad that you just fell down on the ground and squirmed? That's how bad it was for Jeremiah. He said, oh, the walls of my heart, my heart is beating wildly. I cannot keep silent for I hear the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Uh, Jeremiah knew what it was like to be in the pit, both emotionally and physically. Uh, God told the Old Testament king Hezekiah, once that that he had a terminal illness. Uh, God sent a prophet to Hezekiah and he said, you're going to die. 
Get ready. Uh, Hezekiah prayed this in Isaiah 38, 13. He said, Like a lion, God breaks all my bones. From day to night, you bring me to an end. So Hezekiah felt like God was a lion who was breaking his bones. Or what about Naomi in the book of Ruth who lost her husband and then lost both of her sons? She said this, Ruth 1, 20 and 21. Uh, Naomi said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. Uh, Mara means bitter. She said, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. She knew what it was like to be so bitter in her soul that she said, don't even call me by my name anymore, just call me bitter. Well, what about the Apostle Paul who wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 1.8? He said, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. So Paul and his associates got so low on their missionary journeys, at one point they didn't even want to get out of the bed in the morning. They despaired of life itself. Uh, think of the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, who suffered uh, from two major things. One of them was gout. If you've ever had gout, you know that's extremely painful. And the other thing he suffered from was debilitating depression. Darkness would just come on him and overwhelm him to the point where he couldn't even lift his head. Spurgeon said this. He said, my spirits were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child. And this happened to him often throughout the course of his adult life. Or think about uh, the obvious example, the Old Testament patriarch Job, Job 3.11. Job said this. Why did I not die at birth, come out of the womb, and expire? Job said, life is so bad, and I'm in such a dark place, I just wish I had been a stillborn. So many mature believers have experienced this dark night of the soul that Psalm 88 is referring to. Uh, notice again how the psalm ends. Look at verse 18 again, <clears throat> the second half of verse 18. The psalmist says, my companions have become darkness. Maybe your translation says this, darkness has become my only companion. The psalm ends with unresolved darkness. It does not have a happy ending. Psalm 88 is a sweet blessing to suffering Christians because it reminds us that the life of a true child of God does not always have a happy ending on this side of eternity. Did you hear me? The ending of the lives of Christian people on this side of eternity it's not always happy. Unrelieved suffering in this life can be the lot of a true believer. And if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus and unrelieved suffering is the hand you've been dealt by him, this psalm is very comforting, is it not? Take, for example, as an illustration of a believer whose life in this world did not have a happy ending, take John the Baptist. You remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist? He said, among those born of women, none has arisen greater than John the Baptist. In other words, Jesus himself said, John the Baptist is the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. Yet his life ended in darkness and in discouragement and disillusionment. You know, King Herod arrested John the Baptist because John the Baptist told him, you, you shouldn't marry your brother's wife. And so King Herod put him in jail. Matthew 11, 2 says this. Matthew 11, 2 says, now when John, that will be John the Baptist, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to Jesus, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Here's John the Baptist in prison, a strong, strong believer. He sends his disciples out and says, you need to ask Jesus if he's really the Messiah. Do you hear the disillusionment in John's voice? He's like, why am I here in prison suffering under the hand of wicked men if Jesus is the Messiah? He's not doing anything to help me. Do you hear that in his voice? Are you the one who is to come? Are you really the Messiah, Jesus? And then uh, John the Baptist was beheaded at the request of a teenage pole dancer. He was beheaded. Not, not, not only was he beheaded, but at the request of a teenage pole dancer. That's how this believer's life ended. Listen to Matthew 14, verse 6 through 11. It says, But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. 
He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. So the life of true believers can have an extremely sad ending on this side of eternity. But unrelieved suffering does not prove that God's displeased with us, and it does not prove that his good purposes for us have been defeated. Psalm 88 is a balm for the soul of any Christian who experiences unrelieved suffering. So how do we navigate seasons of darkness and despair? One, realize you're not the only Christian who feels this way. Number two, number two, tell God exactly how you feel. Okay? Tell God just exactly how you feel feel. Psalm 88 shows us how to take our griefs and disappointments to God in a way that is frank and forthright, to pour our hearts out to him in this way. Uh, we don't know exactly what Heman's affliction was, but he brought his grief and pain to God with brutal honesty. Uh, notice this. First, he says in verse 3, my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. Uh, verse 4, he says, I've got no strength. He says, I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength. He says, I'm just helpless, Lord. My soul is filled up with troubles. Then verse 5, he says this, I'm like one set loose among the dead. I, I like that phrase. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. He comes to the Lord and he says, uh, I'm like a soldier who's died on a Civil War battlefield. Imagine a battlefield full of dead corpses, and they're about to be gathered up and thrown into a mass grave and buried and forgotten forever. He says, I'm like one of those corpses dead on the battlefield, forgotten by you, God. Heman doesn't hold anything back. He even tells God this. He tells God how he feels about God. Did you notice that in the psalm? Did you notice all the occurrences of the words you and your, you and your? Verse 6, look at verse 6. He says, you have put me in the depths of the pit. Who is you? This is God. So you have put me in the depths of the pit. Verse 7, your wrath lies heavy on me. Verse 8, you have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a whore to them. Verse 16, verse 16, your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. Verse 18, you have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. So seven times in this psalm, Heman tells God that the unbearable circumstances are whose fault? God's fault. God's fault. Have any of you ever felt like that? That the unbearable circumstances of your life are God's fault? Have you ever felt upset with God because you know full well that he could alleviate the pain, he could take away the suffering, he could change the circumstances in an instant, but he doesn't? And your heart says, God... I know that you could have stopped this awful thing from happening, but you didn't. God, I know that you're powerful enough to rescue me from all this right now, but you don't. God, I know that you could change these awful circumstances with a word, but you remain silent, God. Have you ever felt like that? Well, Heman does, and the reason he does is because he has good theology. He knows that God's sovereign over even the most minute details of our lives. Uh, Jesus put it this way in Matthew 10, 29. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. You see, Heman knows that God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. And even though God is not the author of evil, Heman knows this. God may not have caused it, but he sure did allow it. God allowed what is happening to me, the author of this psalm says. And when Heman says, God, you've done all this, it's Heman's way of saying, God, all this suffering is causing me to question your goodness right now. And he tells God that. You've done this to me. He's unburdening his heart to God. And when we suffer, we should do the same as Christian people. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, he says, your wrath lies heavy upon me. Uh, one translation I read put this really well. Your anger bears down on me. And so the psalmist was in such a bad place that he had also come to question not just God's goodness, but God's love for him. He said, I feel like you're angry with me, God. 
Rather than feeling loved by God, he felt like God had something against him. What a painful experience it is to feel like God is angry or upset with us because we're experiencing such hard circumstances in life. You know, if we feel like God is for us, just bring it on. We can take anything. But if we feel like God's angry with us, I can't handle anything. Can you? But Heman said, Lord, I feel like you're angry with me. I'm in such a dark, dark place. And he, t he told God this. This is how I'm feeling. I feel like you're angry with me. Church, we live in a fallen world. And this is a world that languishes under the curse of sin. And based on outward experiences and outward circumstances, it can be very hard to tell who God loves <laughs> in a special covenantal way and who the unbelievers are. Just judging by outward circumstances. In this fallen world, righteousness is not always rewarded, and wickedness does not always receive the punishment that it deserves. The author of Ecclesiastes put it this way in Ecclesiastes 8.14. He said this, There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. And so Psalm 88 reminds us that when life gets bad, it's not necessarily a sign that God is angry with us or that he has stopped loving us. We live in a world that is under the curse of sin. Now, uh, Heman tells God how he feels. He even unleashes a bit of sarcasm. Did you see that in verses 10 through 12? Uh, verses 10 through 12 are sarcastic, okay? Look at, we just look at verse 10. Verse 10 says this. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? He's like, all right, God, you're not going to help me? What are you going to get out of me when I'm dead? Then who's going to praise you? Verse 10 through 12 are all sarcasm. He lays it all out there. And that's what you and I should do when these dark times come. You know, the thing is, you say, well, should I, t should I talk to God like that? Well, if you don't, it's not like he doesn't know how you feel. It's not like you're hiding anything from him. Uh, tell God about your disappointment. Tell him, I am questioning your goodness and your love right now. And say, Lord, I am grieved and disappointed that you have not acted in the way that I asked you to and hoped that you would. Tell him how it hurts and let him bear the burdens. Psalm 88 teaches us this. You see, God is not scared of the dark, and he's not scared of your questions and doubts or my questions and doubts. You're not going to scare him away with honest prayers of pain. He's big enough to handle them. In fact, he welcomes such prayers. Jesus hears our prayers. He sympathizes with our grief, our pain, and our, our disappointment. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. He's able to sympathize with our weakness. But one who in every respect has been tempted, you might even translate that tested, as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, when you're suffering and you're in the pit of despair, when you're in the dark night of the soul, you can come and you can tell Brent Stewart, and I can say, I know what that feels like. But I really don't know what that feels like because I'm not you, and I don't have your exact circumstances. But Jesus knows what that feels like. He understands. He's been there. He's been tempted and tested in every way that we are, Hebrews 4 says. He lived in this fallen world. He felt the despair of the cross. He felt the emptiness of the grave. He gets it. He sympathizes with us. And therefore, when we come to him in honesty and we unburden our hearts before him, he is eager to hear us. He doesn't say, oh, don't complain to me. He says, I've been there. I've lived in a world under the curse. I've been mocked, spit on, abused, mistreated. I felt utter abandonment. He sympathizes with us. So how do we navigate seasons of darkness and despair? One, realize you're not the only one. Two, tell God exactly how you feel. Thirdly, finally, keep crying out to God no matter how dark it gets. Keep crying out to God no matter how dark it gets. This is what the psalmist does. He keeps praying. He keeps crying out to God in spite of his brokenness. You see this in verse 1? 
O Lord God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Then go down to verse 9. Verse 9. He says, every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread my hands out to you. Verse 13. Verse 13. But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. So personally, when I am disappointed and hurting and I get in a bad, dark place, I want to give God the silent treatment. I'll show him. Uh, Heman doesn't do that. He keeps bringing his complaint to God. He keeps bringing his, his hurts and his fears and his doubts to God. One of the obvious purposes of this bleak psalm is to show Christian people that sometimes we have to come to God in the dark and sometimes we have to come to God in the dark for a long, long time. Come to him in the dark and keep coming. Don't let the darkness stop you. Three times the psalmist says that he continues to cry out to God in prayer even though he feels like he's been totally forsaken by God. Even though he's disappointed and disheartened by the fact that in spite of all his attending to prayer, all his diligence in prayer, all his vigilance in prayer, God still has not answered him. The heavens are brass. Look at verse 13 and 14. He says, But I, O Lord, cry to you in the morning. My prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face to me? He says, Look, I've been praying and praying and praying for such a long, long time. Why are you not answering me? Why will you not show up and do something? Why are you hiding your face from me? Sometimes the despair we feel as Christian people, and I think this is often the case, is a direct result of the fact that we have asked God for something for a long, long time and he, he has not answered. Some of us have been asking God to act in specific ways for decades, and God has still not answered our cries. It seems like he's hiding his face from us. Uh, sometimes our prayers go unanswered because we're not diligent in prayer. But you couldn't say this about Heman. He was very diligent in prayer. He was very zealous in prayer. And still he had not been answered yet. Well, why does God sometimes tarry so long in answering our earnest prayers? We plead with him. We come to him in faith. We ask in faith on and on and on. And God doesn't answer. Why does God do this? Why does he let us fall into such darkness and despair? In order to strengthen our faith. You know, God sometimes puts us in a dark place to drive out every vestige of self-reliance from us. When we despair of all things and have no one to call on who can offer help or comfort, when we have nothing in this world to prop ourselves up with, then we're driven by circumstances to cast ourselves in utter and total dependence on Christ alone. And during such seasons, our faith in Christ is not just strengthened, it is painfully strengthened in a way that will never happen when the sun's shining and the birds are chirping and the flowers are blooming in life. In some circles, uh, we hear, uh, and particularly Pentecostal-type circles, we hear a lot of talk about something called the victorious Christian life. Have you ever heard Christians talk about the victorious Christian life? Uh, this, in modern vernacular, is a Christian life where we overcome all of our hurts, uh, our failures and pain, and we become healthy and wealthy and well-respected. We even overcome all our besetting sins, and we just become a winner in every way. That would be the victorious Christian life. But this psalmist shows us that the real victorious Christian life consists in this. I am holding on to God <laughs> in spite of the fact that my life has become almost unbearable. How's that for a victorious Christian life. In spite of unrelieved suffering, I keep coming to the Lord in faith. Here's what the victorious, real victorious Christian life sounds like. It sounds like a man in utter despair uttering the words of verse 1. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you day and night. That's the victorious Christian life. Things are so bleak for this guy, he can't even get a word of hope in the whole psalm. But yet he says, God of my salvation, I keep coming to you. Heman writes like a man who is absolutely hopeless. But the fact that he keeps coming to God and asking shows that he's really not hopeless, is he? If he didn't have any hope, he quit coming. But he keeps coming to the Lord. And the fact that he does shows that God is still his hope, still his salvation, in spite of any appearance to the contrary. 
People who utter despairing prayers are not the people who have no hope and no victory. The people who have no hope and no victory are the people who stop offering those prayers. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 says this, Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory. Talking about the victorious Christian life. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. So in spite of the hopeless tone of Psalm 88, Haman had this victory, this victorious Christian life that overcame the world. He had the faith that kept calling out to God in the midst of despair. And Jesus told us a parable about this victorious faith that keeps coming to God in spite of bleak circumstances. He, he told us this parable in Luke 18, 1 to 8. It's the parable that Michael read. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find what? Will he find faith on earth? What kind of faith is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the faith of Heman that keeps coming to God and coming to God and coming to God in spite of long periods of unanswered prayer. Uh, Heman had this kind of victorious faith that kept crying out, and we should too. Look at verse 15. The psalmist says, Afflicted and close to death from my youth up. From my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. How long had Heman been praying to God uh, that he, God would alleviate some of these things that he'd been struggling, struggling with? How long? From my youth up. In other words, throughout his whole adult life and even in his youth, he had been asking God to help him in some way. And yet, the prayer was still unanswered. The victorious Christian life looks like this. We ask for something for a long, long time, and we do not lose hope. We keep asking. Paul talks about this victorious Christian life in Romans 8.37. Romans 8.37. He says this. This is one of our favorite verses as Christian people. We are more than what? We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. We love that verse, don't we? You know, you know what the verse says that comes right before it? Romans 8.36. It says this. For your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And in all that, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Heman was a victor because he continued to call out to God in faith in spite of his despair. So ultimately, as we think about Psalm 88, there is only one true believer who has ever lived for whom this psalm was absolutely true. You see, Heman said this in verse 9. He said he felt deep sorrow. Do you see that? He said, my eye grows dim through sorrow. But the Lord Jesus felt unspeakable and undiluted sorrow. He said in Matthew 26, verse 36 to 37, Then Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And, talking, and taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. Yes, we felt sorrow. But the only person who has ever felt undiluted, absolute sorrow is the Lord Jesus. He said, my soul is sorrowful to the point of dying from sorrow. Heman felt like the object of scorn and reproach to his friends. Do you see that in verse 8? He said, you've caused my companions to shun me. You've made me a whore to them. Heman said, I've lost all my friends. The Lord Jesus was rejected by all men. By all men, not just his friends. Isaiah 53, 3 says this about Christ. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus knew what it was like to have the whole world turn his back on him, turn their back on him. 
Uh, Heman felt cut off from God. Do you see that in verse 5? It says, I feel like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. But Heman wasn't actually cut off from God's hand. Jesus really was cut off from the Father. Isaiah 53, 8 says this, speaking of Christ, says, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. So Heman felt like he was forsaken by God. That's how he felt. Jesus didn't just feel forsaken by God. He was forsaken by God. And the simple fact is this, whenever a Christian feels forsaken by God, it's never really anything but a feeling. Because Jesus felt undiluted sorrow and he experienced undiluted rejection. Because he was forsaken by the Father in our place, we will never be forsaken by God in spite of the fact that we may feel we're forsaken by God. Jesus died on our behalf. He took away the guilt of our sin and he reconciled us to the Father. And that means that even if our story on this side of the grave does not have a happy ending, the finished work of Christ guarantees that our eternity does. This is really a psalm that is absolutely, totally and utterly true of Jesus himself. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we know if we live long enough, we're going to experience times of great despair, great grief, great darkness, and we will feel oftentimes unloved by you, forsaken by you. We will question your goodness. Lord, we live in a fallen world, and uh, we're broken. The world around us is broken. Our friends and family are broken. Uh, Our fellow church members are broken. And so, Father, we are thankful for the reminder that though we may feel forsaken at times, it's only a feeling. We never really are. The Lord Jesus was forsaken so that we never will be. Uh, Thank you, Father, that you love us and that you work all things for our good. We also thank you for Psalm 88 and the way that it reminds us that uh, we're not the only people who feel this way, for the way that it reminds us to keep coming to you, for the way that it reminds us that we can unburden our hearts to you in complete honesty and tell you exactly how we feel. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us how to grieve and lament the difficulties and the trials of life in a way that is honest, in a way that uh, shows our hope is in you because we keep coming to you. And we pray that you would give us the faith that is victorious even in the hardest of circumstances. We also pray uh, for those in our congregation this morning who have such unrelenting, difficult circumstances in their life, whether that be uh, indwelling sin that we fight with and get so discouraged that we seem to not be getting anywhere, or physical suffering, or sickness, or uh, just a broken down body, or relational difficulties, Lord. Would would you buoy our hearts today, and would you remind us uh, that though circumstances in this life may not be what we would have them to be, that the next life is nothing but joy and peace in the Holy Spirit because Jesus has paved the way there with his own blood. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Go to the Lord in prayer while I be placed.
remind you as always that the Lord's table is for baptized believers in Jesus Christ. For those who have rested all their hope on the blood of Christ to take away their sin. For those who have trusted in the righteousness of Christ imputed to you for a right standing with the Father. If you're not a baptized believer, refrain from partaking of this meal until you have repented and believed. And then you may partake. The Lord's table is for saved sinners. That's what every Christian is. We are all saved sinners. But if you're harboring some kind of unrepentant sin in your heart, we ask that you would do business with the Lord and make that right with him before you partake. When you're ready, you may come. First Corinthians 11, Paul wrote these words. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing Known and Loved. Hey. 
10 says this, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You're at liberty to go. Thank you.